I'm wearing this shirt today because my daughter has a shirt just like it, and she's, she, her husband tells her, when you wear that shirt, it makes me think that you're a lumberjack. <laughs> so I saw, I happened to see one, so I bought one too, so now there's two lumberjacks in the family. I, I just shared with Larry that, uh, and with Wayne too, that, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, I got on my son's heart. I've been chickening out to do this, but I got on his Harley, and uh, I started it last night. And uh, I about scared myself to death. <laughs> I mean, when that thing starts up, you know, you get the goosebumps and your hair stands up. You're like, wow. I turned it off really quick. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I pictured in my mind Christopher laughing, you know, getting the biggest kick out of that, you know. So, praise God. Well, let's do this. Let's all stand up then as I begin by reading some of the word over us. We're going to be in the book of Revelation chapter 3 as we continue our journey through the Bible cover to cover. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. I'm calling this teaching the church on life support. And I'm just going to read the first three verses of Revelation chapter 3. Jesus uh, dictating to John the beloved disciple and in verse 1 it reads, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things, says he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, these are indeed sobering words. And Heavenly Father, as we approach uh, this study, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would speak loudly and clearly to us through your Holy Spirit. Give us, as you continued to repeat to the other churches, give us ears to hear. You know, don't let us miss out on these all-important truths that you, Lord Jesus, are writing to the church. Holy Spirit, help me to step aside and you be the teacher. Anoint my words, Lord, for your church. And I ask this in Jesus' wonderful name, and everyone says, Amen. you may be seated. The church that we're looking at today is the church of Sardis. And what quickly becomes apparent as you study about the church of Sardis is that they desperately needed to be in the emergency room. But the fascinating thing is they didn't look like they needed to belong there. They had a reputation. Their reputation was for health and strength and vitality. And, you know, who knows? They probably had a beautiful church as we'll go on. I'll explain that why. But... Uh, that's just what people thought about them. That, that was definitely not the reality. The reality was is that they were fading fast. Uh, a fact, Jesus says to them uh, that they're dead. I, I don't know, does that just floor you? It floors me that Jesus, who loves his church, and by the way, uh, What's been made clear here is that Jesus stands in the midst of his church. So Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, is standing here in the midst of his church. And I'm trying to imagine him speaking to a church and say, you guys think you're alive, but you're not. You're dead. I mean, that's an absolute shocking statement. Uh, he says, I know your works. In other words... <laughs> I know what you guys are doing, okay? I, I understand completely. I'm not, I'm not blind to that. I understand you guys have services. I know that you guys have a worship time. I know you guys have a reputation for giving and being generous. You have a name. You have a name. 
What's that? That's a reputation. You have a reputation. The reputation states you're alive. But the truth of the matter is, you're dead. I think that Jesus standing in the midst of the church that he loves, and that'll become very evident how much he loves them, but to make a statement like that must absolutely break his heart, as well as some of the folks that are in the church, to be sure, shocked. Are you familiar with those uh, probes that uh, electricians use uh, before they touch a wire? You know, they, they put these probes on, if it lights up, that means the wire's live, don't touch it, you know? Well, it's as though Jesus has a spiritual life meter spiritual life probe and he holds it up to the church of sardis and nothing nothing lights up spiritual life it, no pulse there's no heartbeat in this church they may have had the mechanics they may have had the um, they may have had the motion but they were sorely lacking the emotion of a love relationship between themselves and the Lord. Thomas Paine, anybody familiar with him? Thomas Paine, famous man. Uh, he, in fact, one of his greatest quotes is, these are the times that try men's souls. Have you heard that? Uh, he said that, and boy, if that applies to today, I don't know what does. But Thomas Paine also wrote, reputation is what men and women think of us. Character is what God and angels know of us. This church belongs in the emergency room. They should be dialing 911. And in the emergency room, the one who would be taking the, the x-ray technician, if you will, is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus has this incredible, uh, could be disconcerting ability to look right through any pretense that we might put up a any facade that just all melts away it's all wax in front of his eyes and he sees right into the heart and the soul of a church and this church well they're in trouble but remember this even if they are dead jesus is the one who raises people from the dead. <laughs> so how much better is it that the one who makes such a pronouncement is also the one who has the power to change such a situation as this? So what's going to happen today as we look through these few verses is we're going to get a prescription. A prescription from Dr. Jesus and Dr. Jesus is going to tell us the answer for such a dire condition. While we go through this, I want you to remember what it is that Jesus has for us and desires to give to us. And it's in John chapter 10, verse 10. Good verse to memorize. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So let's talk about Sardis for a little bit, and maybe we can understand a little bit better how they got into this fix. Maybe we might be able to understand a little better how we can prevent ourselves from getting in such a fix. So let's talk about the ancient city of Sardis, which happens to be one of the greatest cities of the world. Yeah, absolutely. If you were to come up with the 10 great cities in all of history of the world, you would pick Sardis. They were powerful, they were famous, they were wealthy, gold was found running in their streams. It was once the capital city of the kingdom of Lydia, for those of you history buffs that are familiar with that. Back in the sixth century before Christ, it was ruled by an incredibly wealthy king, a king by the name of King Croesus. Anybody ever heard that before, King Croesus? There was for a while a statement that people would make about somebody who was really in the bucks, and they would say, that guy is as rich as Croesus. In fact, uh, you could probably look at somebody like uh, 
Rockefeller. He was the Croesus of America, so to speak, huh? Uh, Bill Gates, the Croesus of, uh, of technology, so to speak. The city of Sardis was built on a mountain <laughs> spur, and it was about 1,500 feet above uh, the valley below. Uh, the way it was situated is it had steep ravines on three sides very difficult to get to you can only come up the main street going forward to this place and uh, it was considered to be virtually impregnable by a head-on assault by any army of its time a number of armies had tried to overthrow the city over the years and plunder all the wealth that was there but uh, they never succeeded sardis felt safe sardis felt comfortable. Sardis even felt, I don't know, I guess you could say complacent. I mean, why not? I mean, we're doing good. Nobody can attack us. We're wealthy beyond belief. Yet twice, two times in history, the city was taken. The city was taken once uh, by the Greeks and once by the Persians. And uh, both times it was taken in a manner where it wasn't a head-on assault but they snuck in and took over the city in the middle of the night sardis had become too confident in their reputation they believed that because they stood proud that they would always stand proud and that certainly was not the case for sardis and it's certainly not the case for anybody who would leave Christ. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can ask you for just a moment to think, consider in your mind, your Christianity. You have a reputation for your faith in Christ. What would people say if we asked them about you? What's that person's reputation when it comes to their faith? You might sit there and feel comfortable and say, hey, people that know me, they'd always, they'd give me a thumbs up. They'd say, that guy is a real man of God. That woman is a real woman of God. Wow, is that a prayer warrior. Wow, is that person involved in the service of the church. Now, that's your reputation. But stop for a moment, and I want you to think in your heart of hearts between you and God and nobody else, what's your faith like? Is it the same as your reputation? Uh, between you and God, just not between anybody else. But if you just ask the Lord right now, Lord, I have a reputation. People think I'm really wet. What do you think, God, about my reputation? Some churches look good on the outside. Some churches look safe. They look confident. Uh, they have a reputation for giving and for service. But some churches, that's not a reality. Some churches have tremendous buildings. They have expensive artwork hanging on the walls. Lots of activities, but they could actually be spiritually dead. A church is not its trappings, but its heart. A church can try to live up to past glories, former spiritual heights, but if the breath of the Holy Spirit is gone from that group of believers, that church is dead. When you look at the church in the book of Acts, it's just fun to go through the book of Acts. And how did they act? What was their response as they first came into a relationship with Jesus Christ? You imagine some of these guys, you know, who had actually been with Jesus or seen him teach. They're just like, you know, you don't get it. He's alive. You know, they were just like, their hearts were, can you imagine your heart just about pounding out of your chest? Jesus standing in front of you and you knew that he was on the cross and you knew he was in the tomb and there he stands and they were just blown away. And on account of that, that love, that knowledge, that desire to be with him and experience his life was just so vibrant within them. You know, they went out sharing. It says that the early church turned the world upside down. 
Hey, they did that without Twitter and without the internet. <laughs> they turned the world, well, actually, what'd they do? They turned the world right side up. What a thing. So how is your Christian walk? Is it alive? Is it exciting? Is it dynamic? Does your heart beat for Jesus like the early church? This church looks alive. They, they look powerful. They, they look rich. But they're as dead as a doornail. They need the Spirit of God to breathe upon them. The beautiful thing is that the Spirit of God desires to breathe upon the people of God. Perhaps some of us today need the Holy Spirit to breathe upon us. The good news is he wants to. The good news is he wants to empower us. That's just what God wants to do. He wants to breathe the spiritual death right out of any one of us. Dr. Jesus, today I want you to keep your ears open. I want you to just be ready. If there's any part of this that belongs to you, well, what's that saying? If the shoe fits, <laughs> if any of this belongs to you, then please let me encourage you with all my heart that you would pay attention to what Dr. Jesus has to say. I don't want any of you coming near any of this. Uh, these last two letters that we've gone through have been really heavy. And they've been, you know, they've just been heavy, haven't they? The Church of Thyatira, the compromising church. Wow, that was hard to go through that. And now here this church that's spiritually dead. You know, Sardis, I, you know, I've been having my own little battle going through these two letters, but uh, here's what I think. I think that if I've had to live with the heaviness of these two letters for the last couple of weeks, do you think I'm going to let you off the hook? <laughs> That's not going to happen. Is that okay? All right, good. Uh, let's walk through the word then and see what happens. Verse 1, to the angel of the church of Sardis, and more and more I'm thinking of these angels, that he's speaking of, these messengers and the stars, I think those are, I think they're the pastors of the church. It just seems to fit to me. Uh, and to the angel of the church is Sardis write. So this guy's going to get the letter and then he's going to deliver it to the church. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Seven stars are the seven churches, the seven messengers of the seven churches, maybe angels themselves. I believe here Jesus is letting them know what? Uh, I, I got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I have seven is a number of completeness or fullness, right? Jesus is like, I've got the fullness of the Holy Spirit. What's this church lacking? the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus represents himself to them as being the one, I've got what you need. And he uh, holds the churches in his hands. And what they're lacking is what he wants to give to them. It's like, it's like running out of gas. You're driving your car and you happen to run out of gas. Let me encourage you not to kick the tires. Instead, get a fill up. And so if any of this applies, or as it applies, I know to whatever extent it applies to each one of us, to myself included, I'm sitting down right next to you listening to Jesus' words, uh, then ask for a Philip. Jesus said, if you ask your father for something good, is he going to give you something bad? If you ask for the Spirit, won't he give you the Spirit? You know, it's one of those faith things again, right? That believing that God loves you, knowing that he thinks about you. I was speaking to a young man uh, this past, uh, well, it was probably Thursday morning, a young man I really enjoy from Teen Challenge, and he asked to meet with me, and I met with him, and back and forth we went, and, and I listened, and then finally I said to him, I said, I, I, I want you to know all these questions that you have. The first thing I want you to know is that God's resolved every one of them. There, there's no time at which God wrings his hands and says, oh my gosh, 
you know, <laughs> what am I going to do with you? You know, he just doesn't do that. You know, he's got I, he's got it all figured out. And then I, I I felt prompted by the Lord, and I said, plus I want you to know that he's not like figuring it out as you go, but he had this figured out prior to creation. There wasn't a single thing. <laughs> there was just God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit complete in themselves, not lacking anything. Before that, in that time, before there was anything, he had it all figured out as far as your life and my life is concerned. Let me go a step further. He knew about you. <laughs> how many hairs there'd be on the top of your head and how tall you'd be and what your eye color would be and... Let me take it even a step further than that. When he spoke creation into existence, in the mind of God were the very molecules, were the very atoms that would end up making you. And he spoke those into existence. And as he spoke those into existence, he was saying, Father, that one's mine. God's got it top to bottom you know and, and a wonderful guy just began to laugh and smile with joy and and that's a word for each one of us as well then this really hard statement look at the second part of verse one i know your works and look we, we're already talking about this i think that the way that this is being said is I know your works, and it's got nothing to do with your reputation. I know your works, and there's a disconnect. I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. You cannot say that Sardis is a church alive, although they might have looked like it. They might have had a tremendous worship leaders and the whole nine yards and uh, they were so rich. I'm sure they had a wonderful cathedral there. I mean, this church is not alive. You can say it once was alive. This is the believer who has the Bible. This is the believer that knows the Christian lingo. This is the believer who can hang with the best of them in the things of faith and the things of the scripture. But it's all show. It's all show and no go. No God. Like somebody who's resting on the past, you know what I mean? Once they walked closely with God, once Jesus was their very best friend, once they willingly served the Lord and they loved serving the church family, once they loved to worship, you couldn't hold them back when worship started. They were there and they were praising God. They had daily prayers. It wasn't out of the ordinary. It was their custom to have daily prayers. But that was a long time ago. And any glory that that engendered has long since faded. So where are you with the Lord today? Today. No other day counts. Where are you with the Lord today? Where am I with the Lord today? How was your prayer time today? How was your time talking to Jesus? Did that go well? Look. Jesus wants a living, loving, vibrant relationship with you. He wants your relationship to him to be marked with life. He wants to hold up those spiritual probes to your heart and that doggone thing just lights up. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. I love you, Lord. Look at verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. <laughs> the last of the embers are just about to go out. Ever been at a, at a fire ring and the last of the embers are just about to go out? For I have not found your works perfect, another word would be complete, before God, before Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm hearing something like this. 
you've done good as far as you have gone, but you quit. You let up. You, you've not gone far enough. What happened? It's, it's almost like Jesus is like, what happened to you? With as much as you know? With as much as you've been given? With your understanding of the scriptures that the Holy Spirit has given you? What is going on? Be watchful. The indication here is this is a group of people who outwardly profess Christ. Yeah, we're Christians here. Boy, oh boy, it says that on the banner. Christian church, come on in. You're welcome. They thought of themselves as true blue believers. But in reality, they were Christians only in name. Once, Jeannie and I were at a, uh, a really nice restaurant. And uh, I don't even know if you remember this or not. I remember laughing about it. I thought it was great. McDonald's? Well, yeah. McDonald's. <laughs> it was a little bit nicer than that. And on the wall was this uh, pheasant. You know, they have those beautiful uh, feathers, don't they? They're kind of iridescent, little green, little blue, you know. Uh, that's the men, anyway. At any rate, uh, there, there's this bird hanging on the wall. And Jeannie was looking at it, and I just kind of looked at her, and, and uh, she remarked, uh, that thing is beautiful. Too bad it's dead. <laughs> and that sums up the Church of Sardis. And that sums up some churches today. And because churches are made of people... That sums up some people today. They look great. Too bad they're dead. Fortunately, Jesus gives the correction which will start up a beating heart. This is like, a, what's it, in a hospital, they, yeah, they, they call for the crash cart, right? A stat or whatever it is they say. Then they get those things and they go, Chung. That's what this is intended to be from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he begins with these words. Be watchful. So they've got their eyes closed or they've got their eyes on other things. But he says be watchful. Now interesting, the uh, English Standard Version uses the term wake up. <laughs> I think I like that better. Wake up. Snap out of it. You've been given too much. You've been forgiven. You've been blessed. And the presence of God has been in your life. Wake up. Bring back the prayers, would you? Would you bring back the prayers in your life? That talking to God, that back and forth, that is so filling and satisfying and not only affects your lives, but the lives of the people around you that you know and love. Where's the worship? Oh my goodness, there is, there is so much good Christian music right now. You can pick any genre you like, from, from rap to the, to the old, oldie oldie hymns, you know. Find that station, find that music, you know, and bring it back into your life. Bring it back into your home. Light it up, would you? Light it up. Where's the fellowship? used to be a big deal a lot of people's lives you know let's not talk about the NFL <laughs> is it okay all right let's talk about the NFL uh, <laughs> okay all right you know that 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 there's so much fret don't you pray and don't pray with them and you know don't the coaches can't lead in prayer the guy who sings the national anthem can't pray am I right or am I right everybody will get not everybody some people will get real upset or lawsuit or whatever okay so the nfl players are kneeling while the national anthem's going on i heard one guy said they're not protesting they're praying i thought that was illegal anyway just thought i'd throw that out there that's my little one little thing <laughs> i should have kept it to myself now that i think of it but look at verse three uh, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast. 
Repent! Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Oh, that rings a little bell now, doesn't it? Because how is it that Sardis got taken by the Persians and by the Greeks? Wasn't it the soldiers climbing up the side of the hill and sneaking in through the back door that wasn't watched and, and taking over the city? Jesus, Jesus is, I, I think that he uses this terminology before, that he's going to come like a thief in the night, you know. And the whole picture is this. You imagine being at home, your phone rings, ring, ring, hello. Who is this? A thief. Yes. And you're, what? You're going to be here at 2.30. Okay, I'll be waiting. <laughs> No thief would do that, right? That's the picture that's being given. That's crazy. Jesus says, I'm going to come at a time when you don't expect it. I'm going to show up. And what are you going to say then? What are you going to say then? You see, the coming of Jesus Christ is supposed to be the tremendous comfort of every saint. Don't we comfort ourselves with those words sometimes? I know things are hard. I know it's difficult. I know the world is getting darker. But guess what? Jesus is coming back. And he's going to rule and reign. And he's going to make everything right. It's meant to comfort us. It's meant to make us happy. To see the face of our rescuer. To see the face of our redeemer. We've had some people, you know, all these crazy things that are happening in the news. And, and uh you know, the terrible thing that happened there in Las Vegas. But they reunite somebody who got rescued uh, with somebody who rescued them, right? You seen those, you know? And, and, and the person who did the rescuing is like, oh, I'm not a hero, don't, you know, don't, I just did what anybody would do. And then the, the person that was like looking at them with like love, you know, it's like, you know, I, I'm alive on account of you. Can I give you a hug? You know what I mean? Well, I, I, I would be dead if it wasn't for you. I, you know, just that that's the idea that we're to, you're going to, that's my redeemer. That's the one who saved me. He spared me. He didn't have to. There was nothing I could have done to save myself. But there's my Jesus. My rescuer. That's the idea that is supposed to have. And I think what's going to happen, no, I, I, I'm sure of it. For some people, when Jesus shows up, it's going to be all hallelujahs and smiles and wow. And to other people, it's going to be the saddest surprise, perhaps, of their whole history. Yeah. I, I need to get myself right and I need to be praying. I need to be praying. There's some people in my family. I don't know if they're... I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know about some folks in my own family if they're going to be in heaven. I, I, can't, I can't wrap my mind around the idea of them being in that other place. Oh, man i got to get my prayer act together. I get, I, I'm going to see Jesus. And I want to stay right for that. I want to stay alive for that. And I don't want to be surprised by that. And do you know that my Jesus said this? He said, pray that you're counted worthy to escape all these things. You prayed that lately? Pray that you're found worthy to escape all these things. Apparently some people are not going to escape. That frightens me. Catch this though. Jesus is a life giver. Don't you love that? Jesus is a life giver. Boy, put that on a bumper sticker. I'll put it on my car. You see, he is life. He's all about life. <laughs> it's not, he says, anybody who comes to me, I'll in no wise turn away. You say, well, that one could never come, and that one, that one will never give their life to Christ, and that one disagrees with half of what the Bible says. Hey, Jesus gives life to anybody who'll come to him. So what do I need to be praying? Lord, bring that one to you. 
Soften their heart to the things of God. Make yourself, Lord, shown to them as being more glorious than anything that this world thinks that it has to offer. Whatever this world has to offer, whatever little momentary pleasures I can conjure out of a fallen world mean nothing in comparison to the beauty of Christ. And help me to live like that every day. Well, let's go through Jesus' prescription, shall we? Five points. First thing Jesus says to this church that's dead, living off of some reputation, you know. I, I was talking to a fellow one time and I was witnessing to him and I could tell he, he didn't really want to hear me witness to him. And he says to me, he goes, hey, I had an uncle that was a pastor. And, and I thought... Okay, imagine him standing before Jesus and saying, Hey, Jesus, come on, get real. I have an uncle that was a pastor. This is not going to work, will it? Or even, I went to Calvary Chapel Life. Is that it? Or I went to this church or that church. I went to Sardis. Yikes. He says, wake up. Wake up. It's like, catch yourself. Come to. Stop napping. This is no time for sleeping. There's no sleeping in Christianity, is there? Remember that movie, that baseball movie with the gals that played baseball and Tom Hanks was the coach? And one of the girls started crying. What was it called? A League of Their Own. Of their own. Pretty fun movie. And this uh, <laughs> one girl starts crying. And he goes, there's no crying in baseball. Well, there's no napping in Christianity. There's no vacation from your faith in Jesus Christ. There's no time off. You don't clock in and clock out. I think some people think you can do that. You can't do that. You can't play both. So wake up. This is no time for sleeping. Number two, he says, strengthen. That word strengthen, I find, can also be translated stabilize. Isn't that what we say to patients in a hospital? You know, they're in critical, then they're in stable condition. So they're a dead church. Jesus says, wake up. How do you wake up from the dead? I'll tell you how you wake up from the dead. If Jesus says, wake up, and you obey him, you're going to wake up. <laughs> Isn't that what Jesus said to the little girl that he raised from the dead? Talitha Kumi? Which means, little, little sweetheart, arise, wake up. So Jesus says, wake up, you pay attention, you respond. I'm going to wake up, Lord Jesus. Then he says, strengthen, stabilize, stay with it. Stay with the things that remain. Don't let your Bible collect dust. Return to prayer. Live a life where you're daily thankful. That, that takes a, an internal decision to do that, by the way. I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to be thankful. And sometimes, especially through the heartache that we've been going through the last little bit here, I've said to Jeannie a few times, I say, hey, Ginger, we've got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? We have so much to be thankful for. Return to a thankful life. Jesus at one point said to his disciples, Have I been with you so long and yet you do not believe? Could he say that to any of us? Have I been with you so long and still you don't believe the word that I've given you? Nourish your faith. Nourish your love. This is a loveless age. We need to be the contrast to this loveless age. Pay attention to what Jesus has given you so freely. He's coming back to some excitement, to others the sad surprise. Number three, remember therefore, look what it says, remember how. Notice it doesn't say what. Remember how you have received and heard. Well, uh, so I, okay, well, let me think about this. Uh, 
how did I, how did I at first hear and receive the word of God? I was like this. He, Jesus said, what? Did you hear that? Let me look that in my Bible. Jesus said that? Oh my gosh, he said that. What else? I couldn't wait to go to the next study because I knew that God was speaking. I knew that I would hear something that would change my life. Let me ask you. I'm just putting you through what the Holy Spirit put me, has been putting me through. Are you different today than you were based on the teaching you got last week? Did the teaching you received last week make any difference in your life? I think Sardis probably had some great teaching and some great teachers, you know. They could afford the best teachers, you know. They had the dough. Did it make any difference? Apparently they heard, but it made no difference. And Jesus didn't say, how, what did you hear? He said, remember how you heard. How I heard was, I can't wait to hear some more. Then he says, oh, look, uh, if Jesus has worked in your life before, he'll work in your life now. Do you know that? If he's answered your prayers before, he'll answer your prayers now. If he's healed you, then why did he do that? Why did he heal you and keep you around? He kept you around because you can have an impact. The Holy Spirit can have an impact through your life on the people around you. This is not random. This is not stray. This is God intentionally placing you where he has placed you, teaching you what he has taught you so that you then can be a distribution point of his love and of his goodness. Listen to this. I'm going to read this from James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. This is the Phillips translation. Please let this wash over you. James writes, Have done then with impurity and every other evil which touches the lives of others and humbly accept the message that God has sown into your hearts and which can save your souls. Don't, I beg you, only hear the message, but put it into practice. Otherwise, you are merely deluding yourselves. The man who simply hears and does nothing about it is like a man catching his reflection of his own face in a mirror. He sees himself, it is true, but he goes on with whatever he was doing without the slightest recollection of the sort of person he saw in the mirror. But the man who looks into the perfect mirror of God's law, the law of liberty, of freedom, and makes a habit of so doing is not the man who sees and forgets. He puts that law into practice and he wins true happiness. That's the plan that God has for your life. There's nothing distant or mysterious about it. That's what God has for you and has for me. Number five, repent. That's the number five part of the prescription. Uh, repent means to change direction. Just make a U-turn in your thoughts. Uh, I don't care where you've been. I don't care where you've headed. Turn around and head towards Jesus. Leave all else and turn towards Christ. He'll pick you up wherever he finds you. And wonderfully, he will not leave you where he has found you. Isn't that wonderful? He has great, good, precious plans for your eternal life. So, here we have it. Wake up, strengthen the things that remain, remember what you have received and heard, 
and how you have received and heard. Number four, hold fast to what you have. And number five, repent. Look at verse four. You have a few names, even in Sardis. It's, it's almost like the way that Jesus said this is, I'm surprised to tell you, but there's even a few, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. They're still living for Christ. And they shall walk with me in white, that's in righteousness, for they are worthy. Uh, Jesus is looking for a church. He's looking for a bride. He's come to planet Earth because he wants to pull a church out of it. <laughs> he's looking for a bride. And he's looking for one without spot and without wrinkle and without blemish. Look at verse 5. He who overcomes shall, not, shall be clothed, shall be clothed in white garments. Again, righteousness. And I will not, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Rich, can you turn on the air conditioning again? A few have remained faithful. And God always keeps his remnant. And I thank God for the folks that come in here and pray for the service and pray for the church family and remain faithful, even if no one else does. They've already made that commitment. First of the three promises is the promise of eternal righteousness. And I, I pictured this. I pictured a, a, like a little boy walking with his dad and they're wearing the same outfit. And the kid's going, me, my dad, we're, we're, me, me and my dad, we're dressed alike. And that's what it's like. And that's the plan that Jesus has for you. If you hold on, if you stay steady, if you don't fall to this world's evil, if you stay filled up, not with anything else other than the Holy Spirit, the second one that he gives is the promise of a place in heaven. The promise of a place in heaven. Your name written in the Lamb's book of life. This is extremely important. I want you to hold your places there and go to Revelation chapter 20 verse 15. And by the way, you can remind me because when we get there, I want to give you a long explanation on what it means to have a person's name blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. But at any rate, this is so important. Revelation 20, verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Tell me how important is it for you to have your name in the Lamb's book of life? <laughs> There's nothing else, is there? That's it. It's, I don't want my name blotted out. And, and we're going to go through a long explanation of that when we get there. If you are an honest-to-goodness believer, if you've come to Christ in faith, and you have his forgiveness and his life, you will never be blotted out of the book of life. And that word never, by the way, in the Greek, is the strongest form of never, and the Greeks had a lot more bigger vocabulary than we do, but... In the Greek language, it could have been translated. Are you ready? Jesus says this to you and to me. I will never, ever, under any circumstances, blot out your name from the book of life. What a wonderful reassurance Jesus gives us. And then the third thing he promises them, your name will be announced before the Father. <laughs> All right. I, I don't know, I just, I don't know what to say about this. You know, me in heaven, not because of anything I've done, but because strictly because of faith in Jesus Christ, he died for my sins, he's the substitute for my sins. Amen, hallelujah, I believe it. I'm living for Christ now. I'm going to be in heaven, and Jesus is going to say, Father, this is Paul, and he's mine. I just, does that like floor you? Is that like, you, Father, he's mine. <laughs> Announced in hell, I just, I'm just, I just, that flips me out, you know? 
I would think Jesus would probably go like this. Paul, stay down low. I'll never see you. You're okay. I got you covered. Just kind of stay against the wall here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's uh, the closest scene that I could come to this is, uh, is uh, do you remember when Joseph uh, introduced his brothers to Pharaoh? Hey, his brothers were dirty rats, weren't they? <laughs> they, they, were, they were bad. Uh, and not only that, but they were shepherds. And if you know your history, the Egyptians hated shepherds they're dirty and they're smelly and they they they, they you know because the egyptians were all gq weren't they you know they are looking good you know they smell good and then here comes a shepherd but joseph these are my brothers these are my brothers the egyptians wouldn't eat with the brothers but what did joseph do Joseph said, I'm eating with my brothers. And he sat down at the table with them, just like Jesus is going to sit down at the table with you. I have no business here, Lord. And Jesus is going to say, yes, you do, you're mine. I'm just going to, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's going to be something. One commentator wrote, all these expressions help bring out the heavenly standing of those who belong to Christ. In highest heaven, they have nothing to fear. When Jesus Christ vouches for anyone, that person is accepted. And then the last verse, 6, it's familiar because this is the same thing Jesus says to every church, every church then, every church that's ever been, every church now. Jesus says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says says to the churches. Jesus is messaging to us that these are my words. This is me speaking to you right now, loud and clear. Ask the Holy Spirit. He'll confirm to you in your heart that I'm speaking to you, Jesus would say. I'm not just filling up the air with loose syllables. These things are for your life. I want to end with this. It's been said that the church has three purposes. Ah, we got them up. The threefold purpose of a church is this. Upward, inward, and outward. Now let me explain those. Upward to exalt God. The job of the church is the exaltation of God. Just... We're just loving you today, Lord. We're just reflecting back your love, and you're so good, and we thank you so much, and you've given. Lord, we just exalt him. And then the second thing that a church does is it edifies the believer. Edifies is the same word as builds up. So you're being built up right now in the most holy faith, in the word of God. As you hear and as you apply it to your life, you are being edified right now. And then the last thing is outward. So we have upward, inward. Outward is evangelism. Evangelism is where you share your faith. Didn't I just say that Jesus Christ is going to announce you in heaven? And he's going to do it without any shame. He's not ashamed of you. He bought you with his own blood. That's how much he values you. And he's going to announce you in heaven. Can't you announce him on earth? Can't you? He's just asking you to do the same thing in, that he's going to do in heaven. He wants you to do it on earth. Start by telling people, you know, I'm praying for you. I've loved hearing from people the last few weeks. Paul, we're praying for you. Thanks. We're praying for you. I'm praying for you. In fact, you take it from there to, can I pray for you right now? I love my family. I can't wait to, when I get them all sitting around the table and I get to pray, you know? I'm sure the, the grandkids are going, Papa, going on one of those prayers again, you know? <laughs> As individuals then, because individuals make up a church, your job, and let me ask how you're doing it, your job. Your job is to exalt God. Are you exalting him? Your job is to be edified through prayer, using your giftedness and the word of God. 
and fellowship? Are you being edified? And then lastly, are you evangelizing? Have you shared your faith lately with anybody? We have the way ministry here. Brother Larry would be glad to teach you how to share your faith. Five easy steps. <laughs> you know, when I typed this, uh, anybody have the spell checker that just guesses what you're gonna, word you're going to, and then it fills it in? All right, how much do you hate that? <laughs> I don't remember what, Jeannie sent me a message, and it was like, uh, don't forget, don't forget to get the peppercorns. And I was like, what's a peppercorn? You know, I wrote back, what's a, no, it's a periwinkle. Don't forget to get a periwinkle. I was like, I said, well, what's a periwinkle? And she's like, I didn't type in periwinkle. It just, all right. So when I typed this out, I did it, and not until I, I'm glad I was able to change it in my notes, but it didn't say edify, it didn't say exalt God. I wrote down that the three things are to exalt God. So I must have typed it fast and the th must have and it typed in something else. So it didn't say exalt God. It said exhaust God. <laughs> so I got a big laugh out of that. How many of you think you've exhausted God? <laughs> All right. He's God. You can't exhaust him. Okay. All right. You guys ready to pray with me? Let's pray then. Father, I thank you so much for this evening. And I thank you. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray for them as I pray for myself that we would be counted worthy to escape all these things. Lord Jesus, you are life. And I ask then that you would give us that life, pure, holy, and abundant living is what we want. Lord, we know what your word says. We know it. Some of us here probably know the word better than I do. Lord, I'm asking that that word would be made alive in us. That we wouldn't just be people of reputation, but we would be people of character, known by you, used by your spirit in a very dark world to bring light. Bless, I pray, Father, everyone who hears this. For, Lord, you will receive anybody who comes to you. You'll hear the prayers of the repentant sinner, and you'll give eternal life for anybody who believes in Jesus Christ. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for your goodness. I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone says, Amen.